Cicero enters the Temple of Concord, which is surrounded and protected by armed citizens. The Senate lies in wait to see what is to be done with the conspirators that have been captured. At this very moment, Catiline prepares his army at Faisulae. Cicero brings forth the question, what should be done with the conspirators that have been captured? Consul-elect Silanus is chosen to be the first to speak. He proposes that the conspirators be put to death, for their crimes against the Republic were far too great. One senator after the other agreed with Solanus until it was Caesar's turn to speak. Here he spoke caution, urging the senators to, instead of killing the conspirators, send them to their Italian allies, where they will be imprisoned for life and confiscate their property. And, if these men should escape from the towns they were assigned, that those towns will be considered enemies of the state. He reminded the senates of their past oppression, and that illegality of killing a Roman citizen without due process would have an adverse effect among the populace especially to those who give the order. The Senate began to waver. Those who had spoke before him began to change their opinions, opting for Caesar's proposal. Those who had not spoken agreed with him. Cicero, seeing the Senate waver, stood to his feet. Here he spoke what is called his fourth oration against Catiline. Conscript fathers, I can see your concern not only for the Senate and the Republic, but also for me. He tells them to put aside their love for him and to think of their families, that he, Cicero, will gladly and bravely suffer whatever consequence incurs upon him for his actions. He tells the Senate of the destruction that Catiline and his conspirators will bring upon the city, the universal slaughter that will occur. He tells the Senate, look, look at the crimes these men committed, the extent of their conspiracy. It is seen amongst the Romans that being imprisoned for life was a fate worse than death. Cicero played upon this. He told the Senate, if you accept Caesar's proposal, as he is already popular amongst the people, the motion as well will be popular. But if you choose Solanus's proposal, then I, Cicero, can deal with the accusations and easily maintain that proposal to execute the conspirators was more merciful. Former consul Catullus sided with Cicero, but many of the senators still were undecided. Cato, angered by the indecision, when the answer to him was so obvious, he rose to speak. He tells the Senate, these are not issues dealing with the Roman citizens, but these issues dealing with our very livelihood. He tells them, our freedom, our constitution, everything that we have built is at stake. He paints Catiline and these conspirators as sworn enemies of the people. Cato says he sees the idea of clemency and compassion, but these times are dire, and with so many things at stake, now is not the time. Cato will even go as far as to accuse Caesar of being in on the conspiracy. These men are not just criminals in Rome, but all of Italy, and should be dealt with their execution. From Cato's speech, the Senate almost unanimously cheered and sided with Cicero and Solanus's proposal. Shortly after Cicero, a new man amongst the Senate which hadn't occurred for decades, was hailed officially as Pater Patriae, the father of his country, which Cicero will remember for the rest of his life, which he referred to as the greatest moment of his life. But what conspiracy am I talking about? Salve omnis, and you're in for a treat. For this is the Catiline Conspiracy, and the purpose of this video will be to discuss everything about it. We're going to start with the, a brief summary of who Cicero is, as he is a major player, and Catiline himself as well, and the events that pushed him to form a coup d'etat against the Republic. Cicero was born in 106 BC from a small town south of Rome called Arpinum. He came from an equestrian family and so lacked a patrician heritage and nobility. Lacking this, Cicero didn't want to enlist in the military to advance through the political system. Instead, he opted to climb through the Roman courts. His personality and his ability to, at oratory made him a popular figure. His goal was to become consul, so in 75 he served in Sicily as quaestor. Here he gained a reputation for his integrity, his fairness, and after his Quaestorship, the Sicilians turned to Cicero to help bring Varus to justice by representing them in the law courts. Varus had been accused by Sicilians for plundering and extorting the province. Cicero agreed, but they had to wait until Varus' position as pro magistrate finished by the end of 71 BC. Varus, however, had the renowned orator Hortensius defending him, and so in 70 BC, Cicero went toe to toe against Hortensius defeating him in the trial and bringing Varus to justice. This victory made him the most sought-after orator in the Roman courts, and by 69 BC, Cicero became Aedile, and in 66, he became Praetor, furthering his reputation. 
Cicero during this time was more for the popular party than of the senator party. He supported Pompey and defended many figures of the popular party, but Cicero was a conservative at heart. He believed in the Republic and its institutions. He will, however, begin to support the Senate as he eyed the consulship, and for a new man to gain the office, he had to have the backing of the Senate, which is something that was incredibly difficult to achieve. Catiline, however, had been born from an old and noble patrician family, but by the time of his birth, his family name had sunk. Um, not many people were, you know, in his family were doing anything really notable. They had a few consuls, you know, back way back when, but by this time, their name was kind of forgotten or, you know, wasn't important. So to see himself and his family fall to a state of poverty was something that he wouldn't allow. So during the reign of Sulla, Catiline attached himself to the dictator, profiting as much as he could from Sulla's uh, proscriptions. The money he gathered was enough to carry him through the 70s, and in 68, Catiline took office as praetor, and in 67, as propraetorian governor of Africa. Here, he will extort the province for as much money as he could, and would be brought up on extortion charges in Rome. This wasn't special to him. A lot of Roman officials practiced this method of extorting provinces for all their worth and then facing charges afterwards, but they would just bribe the judges and get off. So Catiline, although not the most virtuous, was a popular figure. He was incredibly adaptable and had friends from all parts of society. He had the energy and drive, was known for being a loyal and devoted friend. Cicero describes him as a man who was able, which I agree. Catiline had many rumors floating about him that weren't good though. Some of these rumors are he killed his brother, slept with a virgin priestess of Vesta, deflowered a daughter, uh, killed his wife and son to remarry. It is best to assume that these rumors were more probably of a political ploy against Catiline. Catiline, like Cicero, eyed the consulship, and Catiline had good chances of getting the office. He had the nobility and served in positions of office at Rome and abroad. He had the prerequisites in both popularity and politically. When he put himself as a candidate for a consulship, he was declined and brought up on extortion charges. Catiline at this point will always be in debt and these will haunt his career. He was known for his luxurious living, which required a lot of money, and he would constantly borrow or extort money. Being rejected was a huge blow for him. He was sensitive and probably hated his fellow nobles for rejecting his candidacy. During this time, the current consuls were replaced by the newly elected consuls. The current consuls were Sulla, not to be mistaken with the dictator, and Autronius. And the new consuls were uh, Lucius Cotta and Lucius Torquatus. Autronius, who, like Catiline, was probably angry at being dispelled from the consulship, he was confronted, as well as Catiline, in December of 66 to join Gnaeus Piso in what would be called the First Catiline Conspiracy or the Pisonian Conspiracy. Sullust describes Piso as an extremely audacious, needy, and unstable man and that his lack of resources and malignant character traits roused him to attack the Republic. Catiline will apparently accept what this shows is Catiline's willingness to do whatever means is necessary to gain that ultimate power that he desired. The conspiracy was this. On the 1st of January, they would kill the replacement consuls Lucius Cotta and Lucius Torquatus. Then once power is secured, send Piso to assume command of both provinces of Spain to gather a force large enough to combat Pompey, who at this point is in the east, taking on Mithridates. But uh, apparently word of the conspiracy got out and it was postponed until the 5th of February. But the plans changed. Now they plan to not only kill the consuls, but also kill off many of the senators they didn't like. On the day the plan was to be initiated, Catiline signaled too early when there weren't enough senators to be killed, and the plotters hesitated. The attempt failed, and the conspiracy dissolved before too many people would catch on. For the next year and a half, Catiline mounted up piles of debt, but soon he will enter back into the political arena to try and grab the consulship yet again. During this time, with Pompey away in the east, Crassus will take the mantle of the populares. Crassus was a former consul and had a great deal of wealth accumulated during Sulla's dictatorship. During Crassus's life, he was outshined by Pompey, even though they could be considered equals. 
Crassus may have viewed Pompey as a rival because while Pompey is gone, he will move in to try and secure power that can contend with Pompey. Crassus saw Catiline, Piso, and Autronius as useful tools to strengthen his position. He was able to get Piso through the Senate to get command in Spain. Piso was a known individual who was against Pompey. Having Piso in Spain could bolster Crassus' position. If it ever came to Crassus versus Pompey, Crassus could count on Piso to join him. In 65 BC, Crassus became a censor and upon taking office, quickly proposed two measures. One was to grant citizenship to the people north of the Po River in the province of Gallia Cisalpina, and the other proposal was to annex Egypt as a province by his ally in the idealship, Julius Caesar. The first proposal will allow Crassus to easily recruit men close to Rome, as they will be grateful to him. The second was that Crassus was trying to gain support of the Equites by giving them new province to tax and extort. And it is in Egypt where Crassus would station Julius Caesar, who is in debt to him at this point, with an army to be a threat of Pompey's southern flank in the east. The reason Julius Caesar was in debt to Crassus was because he had just obtained the idealship in 65 and he wanted to gain popularity. He wanted to build up his reputation and so he borrowed heavily to finance lavish gladiatorial games and spectacles as well as creating exhibitions in the forum. To put it into the scale of these lavish events, there were 320 pairs of gladiators who fought in one event. The Senate passed a law limiting how many gladiators one could have in the city as a result of these lavish displays. But more on that later. If Crassus' plan succeeded, he would have been in a very powerful position. But these plans didn't succeed. Piso died in Spain, slain by a Spanish cavalry during a march. The former consul Quintus Catullus led the Optimates to block the proposal for citizenship to the Gauls north of the Po River, and then he led the Optimates and the Equites, which Cicero supported as well, and blocked the proposal to annex Egypt. Now the Senate knew what Crassus was doing. They didn't like Pompey, or one man for any matter, holding too much power, but they also didn't want to replace Pompey for another person who would just be another Pompey, or worse, for that matter. But uh, as a result of these losses, Crassus will end his open anti pompeian and optimist stance and begin to work in the shadows, funding those who he believed would push his agenda. Catiline and Caesar will be those people he funds. Catiline during 65 grew in popularity. The people he attracted would be from all walks of life, from the powerful to the poor, and his home will be a hangout spot for everyone who supported him. Here he will have lavish banquets where he would woo and grow his popularity. However, rumors will start to circulate of the questionable people he had following him or that he was friends with. But he was becoming someone who was destined, so to speak, for the consulship. Caroline will now have to deal with his extortion trial and he will have many big figures coming to his defense. Lucius Torquatus, the consul who Caroline planned to have killed, will defend him. Even Cicero, who was Rome's leading advocate, considered helping him, but this was more to gain a bargaining chip to use later on as Cicero eyed the consulship as well. Crassus will fund Catiline, and Caesar will back him. He will win the trial and continue his growth in popularity. The consulship was up in 64, and Catiline was running for the office. Reports were coming in. The Senate was worried. Catiline was making wild promises. He was going to cancel debts. He was going to proscript the elite and many others. Now, there were others running for the consulship, but most of them were weak candidates. The only strong candidate was Gaius Antonius, but he was another one the senators didn't like, as he was known for being corrupt. Another strong candidate, but with no background whatsoever, was Cicero. Cicero was using his oratorical skills in the law courts, defending important citizens and making influential friendships. Cicero would walk into the forum every day, learning the names and making friendships with as many people as he could. He would be escorted by loyal clients and powerful politicians. His brother Quintus would write for him the Guide to Electioneering, which can still be read today, and one can learn much, as it isn't much different from today's politics. Catalan and Antonius, towards the end of the campaigning for the consulship, were becoming known for the many bribes they were giving out. The Senate tried to stop this by strengthening the penalties for electoral abuse, but was defeated by the tribune Quintus Mucius Orestinus, who used his veto. Cicero was furious. He stood before the Senate and gave his speech 
which is known today as the Oration in the White Toga, in which he insults and attacks Caline and Antonius. He will take full advantage of Caline's past and those rumors, those of which he was accused of sleeping with a Vestal Virgin, deflowering a woman, killing his wife and kid to marry another girl. Cicero took full advantage of this. He brought up his trial, his time in Africa, and most importantly, the rumors about his conspiracy with Piso. He will attack Antonius and Quintus Mucius. Cicero accuses Crassus and Caesar of funding Catiline, allowing him to bribe others. He also accuses Crassus of being an original instigator of the Pisonian conspiracy, thus making Catiline look like a pawn in a bigger game. This speech, just a few days before the elections, brought devastating effects upon Catiline. He tried to defend himself, but to no avail. Cicero has sliced through Catiline, spilling the nature of the man. Even if what Cicero said wasn't true, it was too much to ignore. Cicero made himself the safest bet for the Senate, and they backed him. Those who supported Pompey backed him. Now comes election day. Romans gathered around, casting their votes. Cicero is chosen and succeeds at becoming a consul. But there is one more slot. The other candidates faded, but it was a choice between Antonius and Catiline. Catiline will lose the election and Antonius will be elected consul only because Antonius was the lesser of the two evils and was seen as someone who wasn't a leader. Catiline, who tried twice now to become consul, was now in utter shame. Catiline must have thought that this wasn't fair. Cicero, that loudmouthed nobody, just smeared him across the political arena. Catiline bet everything upon his success, but that bet didn't pay off. He was now in a large amount of debt, and Crassus withdrew his support. Catiline will not give up. There was always next year. Crassus' nervousness was growing. If Pompey returns, he might be another Sulla and Crassus' name will be the first upon that proscription. Crassus will, in the shadow, support Publius Servilius Rulus, a tribune of 64. Rulus was proposing a new land bill. On the surface, the bill was seen to be for the people, to be only a good, but if it passes, it will have unforeseen, catastrophic consequences for the Senate. The bill was this. Public land that was still available would be distributed to the landless Roman citizens, and private land can be bought from private individuals. It can sell public land as well as establish colonies where it saw fit. To implement this, a commission would be set up of 10 people for 5 years. Cicero would nickname this the 10 Kings, because that's what they would be. They would have control over the distribution of land, especially in the newly conquered provinces that Pompey had just taken over. They could decide who gets the land as well. This would put Crassus and his goons in a popular position. They could raise armies where needed and have money coming from the state treasury and from the land they sell. In a society that was very corrupt, they could very likely enrich themselves and bribe anyone who gets in their way. Cicero will be against this, and so will Cato, Catullus, and Lucellus, to name a few. The Senate were vehemently opposed to any one person having too much power and saw right through this land bill. The consul Antonius will be for the land bill and was said to be one of the chosen to be on the commission. Cicero moved against this. Cicero drew the province of Macedonia, a rich province, for proconsul governorship after his consulship was over, and Antonius drew the poor province of Cisalpine Gaul for his. Cicero would exchange provinces with Antonius for his support, to which Antonius gladly accepted. While Antonius was a popularis, he was much more interested in himself. By this time, Cicero was building a conservative coalition between the Equites, the Pompeian supporters, and the Optimates. He will succeed in this during his consulship, which proved to be a substantial bulwark against any of Crassus, Caesar, and Catiline's revolutionary means to gain power. When on January 1st, Cicero becomes consul, he will immediately begin fighting against the land bill. In several speeches, he will single-handedly convince the Roman people to go against the land bill, which had popular support and was in the interest of the Roman people to see it passed, by telling them the reality of the situation. Crassus will give up trying to gain power for the time being. All his efforts failed, and now he will try to be the good guy or the good citizen. Caesar will start to worry about the strength of the Optimates and try to form a wedge between the people and the Optimates by trying to say that the ultimate decree of the Senate, in other words, the, the decree that gave consuls absolute power for a period of six months, was not in the right hands and had been maliciously abused. 
but Cicero will defend and defeat Caesar's attempts to dissuade the populace. Caesar will end up backing out of the limelight for a while. Catiline, however, was still popular and still in the public eye. Cicero was watching him, and Catiline was wooing much of the lower class and destitute Roman citizens. This is because there were many Romans who were unhappy. These included farmers who had lost their land, legionaries, mostly Sulla's men, who acquired land from those farmers who lost their land, but failed to make a living and went into debt. Many people outside of Rome were unhappy with Roman rule, as well as the patricians who had gone into debt or were corrupt flocked to Catiline's cause. Catiline decided to run again for consul in 63, but by this time he was already plotting to take over the state. If he were to win or lose the consulship for 62, he told his conspirators in a meeting that he would cancel their deaths and proscript the rich and a myriad of other spoils that power can offer, and there were only three other candidates running for consul. Servius Sulpicius, a man with noble blood, had some popularity from the courts. Decimus Junius uh, Solanus was defeated two years earlier and wasn't very popular. And lastly, Lucius Licinius Morena. He had served under his father Lucilius in the war against Mithridates and was well liked as praetor amongst the urban people. Although had no one in his family had earned the consulship, he was the strongest candidate against Catiline. Cicero will back Salanus and Morena. Catiline will be bribing his way through the election and so will Morena. Salanus, however, hated this practice and corruption altogether and called upon Cicero to enact stricter laws against bribery. Cicero will agree to this by making anyone guilty of bribery be exiled for 10 years. Cicero was hoping to severely affect Catiline's election campaign, but like all laws enacted against bribery during the Republic, it never really worked. Salanus and Cato will indicate that they were going to bring Catiline to trial for bribery, and Catiline will become furious, believing Cicero passed the law on his account. He will try to kill Cicero and his colleagues on election day. Cicero will hear of this plot and call an emergency meeting of the Senate, imploring them to postpone the elections so that the Senate could debate these matters. But the Senate will ignore his plea, believing it was personal enmity. However, they did call Catiline in to question him. As Cicero and the Senate gathered, Cicero asked Catiline to stand and explain himself. Catiline stood before the Senate, and he will say this, The state has two bodies, one frail with a weak head, and the other strong but with no head at all. And provided that it showed itself worthy of my leadership, this body would never go short of a head so long as I was alive. The Senate was weirded out by these remarks, but this was not enough to postpone the elections. Oddly enough, Cicero will take precaution come election day, and he will gather a group of loyal citizens as bodyguards, and Cicero will wear a breastplate, making sure all can see. Rumors were also spreading of Catiline's plot, and many citizens gathered to see if it would take place. The plot didn't occur, and this act of courage on Cicero's part was enough to cause Catiline to lose the election. You have to remember, even though Catiline is well-liked and is very popular amongst the people, Cicero is held to a higher regard and is very well respected. Thus seeing Cicero's life potentially in danger was enough to sway them against Catiline. Because of Cicero, Catiline will lose the consulship again, for the third time, securing Salanus and Morena. Catiline will go even further into debt. Again, his lavish lifestyle and generosity cost him dearly. This was the final straw for Catiline. He will begin his revolutionary preparations. He will send his closest support to different parts of Italy to gather troops, and when the time comes, incite rebellion. He sent Gaius Manlius, a man who served as centurion under Sulla's legion, to Faisalai in Etruria, to start gathering Sulla's legionaries, who were mostly settled in that part of Italy. Septimius of Camerinum will be sent to Picenum and Gaius Julius to Apula, not to be confused with Gaius Julius Caesar, as well as many others to different places. While they did this, Catiline, along with his conspirators, will begin preparations for seizing the capital. Here they plan to kill the senators, control key strategic locations, and set fires throughout the city. Manlius and the others sent across Italy were to stage the rebellion on the 27th of October, while Catiline and his insurrection would take place on the following day. Cicero was the only real immediate threat and had to be dealt with. Cicero by this time was vigilant. He had informers all throughout Italy and knew something was afoot. However, 
when word got to him from an, one of the main conspirators, Quintus Curius, he told his wife Fulvia, who told Cicero of Catiline's plans for the city's insurrection. When she came to him, Cicero decided for her to be an informant, relaying information of Catiline's plans. On the 20th of October, a mysterious package of letters were left on Crassus's doorstep. Crassus picked up the package and noticed that one of the letters was addressed to him. As he picks up his letter, he can see that some of these other letters were addressed to senators. Some of them were Metellus Scipio and Marcus Marcellus. Crassus will decide to open his letter, and written on that letter was a warning. A warning to Crassus, as well as to many others, that there would be much bloodshed, and that he should leave the city. Crassus was alarmed, and looking at the letters and who they were addressed to, he would gather them at his home, and together they would decide what to do. After discussing all the possibilities, they had decided to inform Cicero. In the dead of night, Crestus and the others arrived on Cicero's doorstep, waking the consul and informing him of Catiline's dangerous plans. Now these letters were unsigned. Nobody knows who sent them. They could have been sent by Catiline, as he may have considered these men friends, or a conspirator foiled the, the plans. In the morning, Cicero calls for an emergency Senate meeting. Here, Cicero tells them of Catiline's nefarious plans. Crassus was the only one who opened the letter, and so Cicero had each one of the senators who had received letters to open them and read them aloud. Then, news was confirmed that Gaius Manlius was gathering an army. The Senate was now deeply concerned. All of Italy was now in danger. Pompey was too far away in the east, and more importantly, Rome was in danger. The Senate passes the ultimate decree to see that the Republic should come to no harm and gave Cicero complete authority over the state. Martial law was now in effect. Cicero and Antonius can now raise troops, go to war, and have complete power over Roman citizens and Rome's allies. Cicero's first action, Quintus Metellus, a distinguished optimate responsible for the subjugation of Crete, bestowed with the name Creticus, will defend Rome beyond its walls, while Cicero deals with Catiline's plans for the city itself. Cicero had claimed that Manlius would take the field on the 27th of October, and on the 28th, Catiline would seize the city. Catiline, who was still in Rome during all of this, was keeping his cool, denying Cicero and his bogus claims. Cicero has headed out for Catiline, a man of noble blood, and has done nothing more than be a man for the people, and was no different than any other Roman. And when the 27th of October came, no news came of Manlius taking the field with his revolutionary army. Well, Cicero, you claim Catiline had an army, ready to take the field, as well as Catiline's plans to incite violence and destruction. The senators were starting to doubt Cicero, confirming their biases about the new man already. He just wanted glory for himself, trying to be something he's not. Catiline continues to act as if he's in good conscience. But then a few days later, in early November, news arrives. A senator, Lucius Sinius, receives a letter. Manlius had taken the field on the 27th of October with an army at Faisulae. More reports are coming in. Rumors, omens, and the like. Weapons were being moved throughout Italy and worse. Slave uprisings at Capua and Apulia. Now you have to remember, hearing that slaves were uprising will send shivers down Roman spines. Spartacus, whose uprising was a decade earlier, was still fresh in the minds of the people, especially the senators. Cicero now had full support of the Senate. They will pass several decrees to meet out the rebellion. Quintus Marcius Rex, ex-governor of Cilicia, and Quintus Metellus Creticus, conqueror of Crete, were ordered to take control of Faisulae and Apulia. The praetors Quintus Pompeius Rufus and Quintus Metellus Keller were instructed to gather an army in Capua and Picenum. Rewards and pardons were issued to all those who had information about the conspiracy. Freedom and 100,000 sesterces for slaves and a pardon with 200,000 sesterces for citizens. However, not a single person would come forward with information. Gladiators were sent to Capua as a garrison and Cicero was in charge of protecting Rome. Catiline will be indicted under the Plautian law, but there won't be enough evidence to find him guilty. Catiline will welcome this indictment with open arms, still believing himself innocent in this whole ordeal. He will even go as far as to offer himself under the custody of Cicero or Manlius Lepidus and Metellus Keller, 
and he will end up staying with Metellus. The prosecution won't occur and Cicero will opt to wait until he had sufficient evidence needed to move against Catiline in the Senate. Even though the Senate still supported Cicero, they were watching him, waiting for him to slip and to prove their prejudice against him. On the 6th of November, Catiline will instruct his conspirators in a meeting to kill Cicero and to see the arrangements of the city's revolt while Catiline was to go to Faisalai to take command of the army. Two men volunteered to kill Cicero in his home early in the morning, Gaius Cornelius and Lucius Varguntius, if I pronounce that right. They will arrive at Cicero's house and find that it was heavily guarded. Cicero's informant Fulvia and Quintus Curius warned Cicero of the coming danger, and thus he was able to scare off the assassins. The next day, on November 8th, Cicero called forth a Senate meeting in the Temple of Jupiter Stator, a building at the foot of the Palatine Hill that was easy to defend, as Cicero had set up guards around the temple. Catiline is believed to be gone at this point, and Cicero was going to fully discuss his conspiracy before the Senate. But just as the Senate was in order, and just as Cicero was about to speak, Catiline stepped foot inside the temple. It turned out he hadn't left. Catiline walked into the room as if he was still innocent, and that he had nothing to do with what had been going on. He takes his seat amongst his fellow senators, but something happens. Everyone's staring at him, and all the senators who were unlucky enough to be seated near him stood up and took their place elsewhere, leaving Catiline all by himself. Cicero, who was angry at Catiline because just the night before he tried to have him killed, and he has the audacity to walk into the temple as if he hadn't just tried to have him murdered, delivers his first speech against Catiline. Cicero calls him out before the Senate, imploring him to leave the city. It really is a brilliant speech. Catiline will try to defend himself, but will be shut down by the shouts of traitor and assassin by the other senators. Catiline rushes home and puts pressure on his other conspirators to continue as planned and to strengthen their forces by whatever means necessary. He will send messages to senators, stating that he was leaving in voluntary exile to Massilia, but in reality was going to take command of his army at Faisalai. By this time, he was still claiming his innocence, and his conspirators in Rome are spreading rumors that Catiline was unjustly accused and that Cicero has no evidence. Romans wanted answers, and Cicero delivered in his next speech, the second oration against Catiline. Here he tells the public exactly what Catiline was up to, where he was going, and his future plans. He warns the conspirators still in the city. He tells them he knows who they are, and he's watching them. He advises them to leave the city and go with Catiline to your doom. Catiline will stop in Aretium for a few days and deal with his fellow conspirator Gaius Flaminius, to supply the locals with weapons and equipment. News will arrive around the 17th of November that Catiline was acting like a consul with 12 lictors and had taken the field with Manlius. Immediately upon hearing this news, the Senate declares Manlius and Catiline enemies of the state. Cicero and Antonius were to raise an army. Antonius was ordered to go out and confront Catiline as quickly as possible while Cicero was to remain within the city to keep Rome safe. A pardon was offered to those who would lay down their arms, but none of Catiline's men gave themselves up. In fact, it seems that Catiline's forces were actually growing in size. The leader of the conspirators in Rome was Lentulus, who planned the attack on Rome on the 16th of December. They were to incite violence against Cicero by stirring up the public, and on the 17th of December, during the Saturnalia, they were to initiate their plans. There seemed to be disagreement amongst the conspirators, Cethegus, wanted to attack as soon as possible, but was overruled by Lentulus. Toward the end of November and beginning of December, things were rather quiet in Rome during this time. While Cicero planned and coordinated with his allies, news came to him. Marcus Porcius Cato Eudicensis, or Cato the Younger, great-grandson of the famous Cato Censorius, or Cato the Elder, prosecuted Morena, the successful consul for 62 and he was joined by Servius Sulpicius Rufus, who was Morena's rival. This couldn't have come at a worse time, and Cicero most likely facepalmed when the news was brought to him. Although Cicero appreciated Cato, he sometimes saw him as a political liability. That is because Cato believed that morality and the principles to which he stood for was more important than the welfare of the state. His beliefs were a mixture of Stoicism and traditional Roman values, now, the reason Morena was being brought up on charges was for bribery during the election campaign, 
which was something that was unfortunately normal at this point. Cicero saw this as a terrible and ignorant move on Cato and Sulpicius's end. Morena was a worthy successor to Cicero and could be relied upon to further Cicero's interest, so Cicero will defend him during this trial. Not only that, but Catiline was in open rebellion and stability was now more important than ever. Hortensius, the great order that Cicero had defeated during the trial of Verres, joined in the defense of Morena, as well as Crassus, who was now acting as a staunch supporter of the Republic. Cicero masterfully defended Morena with his speech, which we have today. Cicero had argued that there was no time, with everything that had been going on, to possibly have one consul for the new year. Cicero, with his argument, was able to beat Cato and Sulpicius. As the conspiracy was underway in Rome, roles were assigned. Cethegus was to kill the senators. Gabinius was to slaughter much of the citizens. Cassius was to start fires. Others were assigned to rob the treasury as well as stop the aqueducts and kill anyone who tried to get water. And they were assigned to smuggle weapons into Rome and were hidden inside Cethegus's house. Cicero watched these men diligently, especially Lentulus, as he knew he was the leader of the operation in Rome. What he needed was proof of their conspiracy, and that moment came when an envoy of the Allobroges, a tribe in Narbonensis Gaul, came to Rome to seek justice against the Roman misrule of their tribe. Now, they had tried twice to get justice, but the Senate put them on the back burner, and so Lentulus thought it a perfect opportunity to gain a fierce ally in their grand conspiracy. He had sent Publius Umbrenus, a man of lesser rank within the conspiracy, but knew the tribe personally, to sway the tribe into joining them. He introduced the envoy to Gabinius, who was a key member, and they were able to convince the tribe to initially join the conspiracy by promising their issues would be resolved once successful. But after thinking about it some more, decided to go to the person assigned to them, Quintus Fabius Sengja, and told him about the conspiracy, which he then went to Cicero. Cicero came up with a plan. He ordered the envoy to go back and to continue to let the conspirators think that they were in on it and to obtain written promises from Lentellus, Cethegus, Statilius, and Cassius. They were able to get these written promises from all but Cassius, who was going to Gaul to oversee the preparations. He had told Titus Voltercius, a friend of Gabinius, to go with the Gallic envoy back home and to send a letter to Caline, which Lentellus gave him to confirm the arrangements. Cicero was informed, and he immediately attacked two praetors, Lucius Flaccus and Caius Pomptinus, to gather a group of armed citizens and to lay in wait to ambush Titus and the envoys with the purpose of capturing those documents. With those documents, Cicero would have the evidence he needed to prove the conspiracy within Rome and bring Lentulus and his men to justice. It's the night of December 2nd, and Titus Voltercius and his Gallic allies leave Rome by way of the Mulvian Bridge. Flaccus and Pomptinus are lying in wait. Titus and his men are making their way to the bridge. Flaccus and Pomptinus, along with the armed men they had gathered, jumped out of hiding and surrounded Titus and the envoy. Titus unsheathed his gladius and called upon the Allobroges to fight, but they knew what was going on and surrendered themselves almost immediately. Titus, with no choice, put down as gladius. Early the next morning, the prisoners and the letters are brought before Cicero. This was the evidence he needed to crush the Roman conspirators. Now we return to the beginning of this video. Cicero orders the Senate to convene in the Temple of Concord, and he brings forth the prisoners Lentulus, Cethegus, Satilius, Gabinius, and Caiparius. He had also sent another praetor, Gaius Sulpicius, to find the hidden stash of weapons inside Cethegus's house. Now, before he sends these prisoners in front of the senators, he first sends out Voltercius, and Cicero offers him a pardon, as long as he reveals everything he knows about Catiline's plans. Now, Titus Voltercius didn't know much about the plot, as he wasn't a key member, but he had general knowledge of it, and knew some of the key members. After identifying some of them, he told the senate that Lentulus gave him the message to Catiline. Then, the Allobroges envoy came in and handed them the written promises by the key members of the urban conspiracy. After reading these written promises, they questioned each key member who had signed it, to which they all confessed. Then Praetor Sulpicius had brought forward the cache of weapons from the house of Cethegus. With all this evidence, Cicero was given the highest praise by the Senate. Praise was also given to Flaccus and Pomptinus, as well as Consul Antonius, 
Lentulus was forced to resign his praetorship and forced to remove his senatorial toga. This was the second time that Lentulus was forced to give this up. Cicero adjourned the Senate and had the key conspirators remain in custody. Cicero would lead the temple and deliver his third oration against Catiline before the eagerly awaiting citizens of Rome. Here he would tell them what has happened and the actions that he and the Senate had taken. The majority of Romans who were supportive of Catiline would now completely turn their back on him. They were for his ideas, but to wantonly destroy parts of Rome, which would include their homes, was a step too far. The next day, on the 4th of December, Lucius Tarquinius, an informer, was brought before the Senate. He made the claim that Crassus was secretly in on the conspiracy. This was an odd statement. Crassus had given direct evidence to Cicero against Catiline when he delivered the letter he had received. Not only that, but he had been very supportive of the Optimates. There is a claim that Cicero put Tarquinius up to this, and Crassus definitely believed this was so. It could have been possible that Cicero was testing the waters to see where Crassus stood, but who knows. There seems to be also a push by senators for Cicero to make a move against Caesar by implicating him in the plot, but Cicero didn't want anything to do with this. There were also attempts to free the ringleaders who were taken prisoner, but Cicero countered this by making sure they were well guarded. On the 5th of December, in the Temple of Concord, Cicero will bring up the question, what should be done with the conspirators? He did this because he wanted the full backing of the Senate, as Cicero had the complete authority to do whatever he wanted to the prisoners. Now, Cicero thought the best approach was to kill the prisoners, despite the implication that might occur in the future. This was because he saw these men as sworn enemies of the Republic, and felt that it, it was his duty to protect it. This approach, however, will cost Cicero, as Caesar and leaders of the Popular Party will use this as a weapon against him, forcing him into exile later on, as killing a Roman citizen quickly, without due process, was seriously looked down upon. But, in my opinion, this was the best course of action to take. Now, if you remember from the beginning of the video, you know what happens. The consul elect Solanus will call forth the death penalty. Caesar will object, saying to put them in prison for life. Cicero will deliver his fourth oration against Catiline. And Cato will put the final nail in the coffin, securing these prisoners' death. This was the best route, because I believe at some point, Caesar would have released these conspirators and used them as tools for his inevitable rise to power and eventual dictatorship. I mean, who knows though? Perhaps these men would have turned a new leaf, but I doubt it as they were all pretty crazy. I mean, Lentulus actually believed, if the sources are correct, that he was destined to rule Rome. Once the decision was made, Cicero had the Via Sacra, which led from the Forum to the prison, posted with guards. Cicero will personally lead Lentulus to the execution chamber, known as the Tullianum. This execution chamber was a subterranean chamber. Its first level was held for prisoners who were awaiting their execution. The execution chamber was about 12 feet underneath that. The only way down into the Tullianum was to be lowered from the ceiling. The three urban magistrates in charge of the Tullianum were instructed by Cicero to prepare the executions. Solus will describe the place writing, there is a place called the Tullianum, about 12 feet below the surface of the ground. It is enclosed on all sides by walls, and above it is a chamber with a vaulted roof of stone. Neglect, darkness, and stench make it hideous and fearsome to behold. When the five prisoners were finally lowered and executed by strangulation, Cicero emerged and said to the crowd, they have lived. The crowd praised Cicero, and so did Catullus and Cato, calling him the father and savior of his country. During this time, more conspirators will be captured, but will not suffer the death penalty. However, Catiline attracted a lot of young, ambitious men, and there are a few cases of their fathers ordering their sons to be executed. Now, this was a thing back during the Roman Republic. The head of the family, the father, or paterfamilias in Latin, had complete authority over the family. He can order anyone in his family killed without repercussion. From my own knowledge, which I admit isn't that extensive on this particular matter, I can only go over what I've read in books. When the father ordered a son or family member to be killed, it is usually because they did something that they considered egregious. Examples would be going against the state, showing a lack of virtue, or disobeying orders. There is a case where a Roman consul named Titus Manlius, and just by his name, you can tell what kind of man he is, ordered his men to stay in the camp. His son, who was a part of the army, took it upon himself 
to take him and his friends to attack an enemy skirmisher group, and to which they successfully defeated them. Well, he tells his father, and his father is furious. He calls his soldiers to gather around, and in front of everyone, orders his son to be killed, because he disobeyed orders. That is just a brief summary, as I would like to make a video on this particular subject at some point in the future. But back to the video. Going back now to the Catalan conspiracy, Catalan had raised around 20,000 troops in Etruria, but only a quarter of them were properly armed, and he managed to stir up trouble in parts of Italy, which were quickly dealt with by the Republic. By this time, Catalan must have seen the writings on the wall. The effectiveness of the Republic under Cicero must have disheartened the cause. However, they didn't know Lentulus had failed, and still had faith in him. When news of Lentulus's failure had arrived, many of those who flocked to Catalan's cause deserted him. Only those who remained were the sullen legions, and those who were so deep in debt they couldn't hope to make it out. Catalan judged that his best course of action was to retreat to Gaul, and so he made his way through the Apennine Mountains, only to find Metellus Keller was waiting for him, and that the consul Antonius was on his tail with a large army. Catalan decided that he would face Antonius, hoping in some way that his old friend would let him win, or that he would have a change of heart. As battle loomed, Antonius fell ill and put his leading officer, Marcus Petrius, in charge. Petrius was a 30-year veteran and knew his army well. Both him and Catiline will give a speech to their men, imploring them to fight bravely. Catiline will also remind his people why they were here, and so on the morning of January 62, the battle commenced. Both sides fought hard. Catiline was on the front line with his light infantry, helping those who were exhausted, finding replacements for the wounded, and slaying many soldiers himself. Petrius saw this and sent his Praetorian cohort into the center which devastated Catiline's forces. Then Catiline's force was hit on both sides and Manlius was the first to fall. When Catiline noticed the battle was lost, he ferociously plunged himself deep into the enemy lines, fighting all those he could fight until he was killed. Both sides suffered, and not a single man in Catiline's army survived. Cicero had at this point just left office, but shortly after leaving office, there was a vote in the tribal assembly, which hailed Cicero as father of his country, or pater patriae. In closing, the Catiline conspiracy was a symptom of a failing republic, which, in less than 50 years, will have been no more. The abuse of the Roman provinces at the hands of his governors and the Roman people by the equites and tax collectors, the rampant corruption and bribery of judges and election campaigns created a toxic environment which would soon spill over in the form of civil wars. If it was not for the efforts of Cicero, who truly believed in the constitution and the republic, would have seen it collapse much sooner. The fact that many Roman citizens supported and joined Catiline's cause shows us how important a system of law and order, which aims at protecting human life and private property, truly is, which Cicero gave us. Cicero has influenced the modern world so much, especially the American government, which he gave us our system of checks and balances, our constitution, as well as our basis on law. We have so much to thank him for. He truly is a great man, the greatest in my opinion. And that's it. Thank you.